something with which I can blackmail you. Um, Excellent. So, <laughs> so I'll, I'll plan on that. But I'll, I don't know. I'll probably say some blackmailable stuff in our interview. So who knows? <laughs> totally fine. Yeah, totally fine. You like you you donate donate to the family council or else. Right. And I'll uh, I'll have to donate. Yeah. <laughs> which I probably would anyway. My, Moses, thank you for being here. It is my pleasure. Excellent. So you uh, today, uh, we wanted to talk about you coming out of Reformed theology, right? Yes, that's that's where I that's where I grew up. I grew up Dutch Reformed, and and now I'm wow. Lutheran. So Dutch Reformed, what's that like? You know, it would be definitely the most similar to being Lutheran, except that you're Reformed in the United States, in the sense that okay. it's got the the ethnic thing going on strong focus on education. Um, so like I, I went to a K through eight, which later became a K through 12 school that was started by the Dutch reformed church a hundred years ago, still there, which is great. And, um, and so I, I really profited from the emphasis that they put on education school is now separate from the church. And yeah. And, and, and they didn't, they didn't do English language stuff till, you know, world war two kind of like, uh, many Lutheran, wow. uh, many Lutheran um, yeah. uh, congregations. So, so yeah, you know, kind of, it was kind of a kind of an accident in the sense that we landed up there. I was actually baptized ELCA. My dad grew up ELCA. I think he grew up going. He he definitely grew up going to Mount Olivet Lutheran in Minneapolis, which is I think or was was the largest Lutheran church in uh, the country. Um, and uh, I'm sure it's not anymore, but um, very, very schmancy, South Minneapolis. Um, so, so then, so that's where my, my parents were. But then my parents divorced uh, when I was nine and we moved, moved to town because we had lived on a, a farm. And, and then we ended up at the, at the Dutch Reformed Church, which was, which was great. Um, but yeah, yeah, Dutch Reformed, if, for, for Lutherans who, who, are, who don't know what that is, it's a lot like Lutheran in in terms of the cultural the cultural uh, uh, wayfinders that help you uh, understand something uh, uh, um, outside of the religious doctrine. It's focused on the Midwest, Michigan, uh, Iowa, um, a little bit of Wisconsin, and uh, it's a little bit insular. It's very folksy, lots of hot dish, and uh, and but they do the Lord's Supper four times a year, uh, if you're lucky. Oh. If you're lucky. And uh, and I didn't take it till I was 18. And um, I don't think that was a policy of the church. I, I just didn't – it was never expressed to me that I could do it earlier. And uh, Wow. And double predestination. So those are the main differences. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, communion four times a year, that sucks. We do it at least four times a month. That's I. That's how it should be. And you know, I've I've been to certainly Reformed churches that do it weekly, but there's not as much of a tradition of that in the Dutch Reformed Church. Certainly not. Do, does that stem from their? Because they obviously it's an ordinance and a memorial for them, not the true body and blood of the Lord. So, I mean, it, uh, honestly, and they say it's important. They say here. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't want to like tangent right away here, but it seems to me that. Reformed reformed people often are very good at like paying lip service to things, but like not like actually caring. You know that oh, uh, you know it's no, it's not the body and blood of the Lord, uh, but it is still very important to us. But like you only do it three four times a year. Like how important how important can it be? Yeah, I mean by by their works you shall know them. I mean. I, I, I can't speak to whether reform people do that about other things. I have the greatest respect right. for, for reform theology in general. But on the sacraments, they really have dropped the ball. I think and and you know what? Yeah. The the most influential theologian on me as a reform person uh, was Peter Lighthart, who was my uh, theology okay. professor um uh, at New St. Andrews College, and he was just is is continues to be an absolute uh dynamo of incredibly intelligent theological uh takes and and he comes out of a presbyterian tradition i think i think that's 
think that's where he grew up. I'm not 100% sure on that. But it's definitely a more high church thing, you know, communion every week, uh, Eucharistic yeah. meditation every service. Pastors wear vestments uh, and celebrate the church year, which is so uh, antithetical to to much of the Reformed, especially the more rock rib traditional Reformed uh, Reformed yeah. Church. And uh, but but that's that's where I that's where I was, and so I'm like, yeah, the Eucharist is super important. But but I came to realize, not to get ahead of myself, but I came to realize that uh, that I wasn't being consistent. I was saying the Eucharist was important, but my theology didn't match that uh, that importance that I was giving it. Right. Um, yeah, and not again, not all Reformed people. You're right. Um, I know there's a lot of variance within the Reformed tradition, um, but there's I think there's a lot of places where. Um, it's easy to to pick at some reformed for saying things are important and then not acting like it. Um, so I, I wasn't trying to take a cheap shot. Uh, no, yeah. But it it just it gets on my nerves though that that because I've had people tell me that they think, oh no, well, I hold the I hold the Eucharist in just as high a respect as you do, but then like they literally don't don't take it every chance they get, yeah. and like that's. You know, it's it, so like you said that you didn't take it until you were 18 and that it wasn't a that wasn't a policy decision by the church. Like you had to be that age to take it. But in a way it was because no one ever told you like, hey, this is for you. Right. Right. That's like the, that's literally the words of Jesus. This is my body for you. Uh, last night was Maundy Thursday and. uh Pastor Joe literally preached on that. Like that was that was the whole sermon. This is my body given for you. That's so great. You know? It's so great. It's so great. And it's it's cool to me to look at like like the debate in Lutheran circles about like when do we commune and all this. And it's so great to see so many people that their stance is just as young as you can, just as soon as you can understand it. Let's go. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's where I am. Absolutely. And yeah. And you got to, and I don't know, like you got to tell people like, Hey, it's for you. Come on. Mm -hmm. You know, so let's get you there. Um, double predestination. So y'all did that, th that bit, huh? The Dutch reformed. Uh, well, actually, uh, you know, I grew up in a very rural area. Um, okay. And so no, I had no idea. Like, you know, the, the sad thing about so many rural churches of every denomination is that catechesis just isn't there. You know, church, church yeah. really like those people love Jesus. Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these are these are farmers. These are people who sell tractors. Um, right. I think there's a couple people who had college degrees. Um, my mom was one of them. Um, and she was one of the, the people who commuted to the Twin Cities, which is where I live now. Um, but they're just, you know, generally there was not a culture of, of taking, there was a culture of taking your faith seriously, for sure, but not a culture. Yeah. And, and that was, that generally meant living right, you know, and I'm, I'm not knocking that yeah. for a second, but it did not mean book learning. It did not mean academic theology. It did not even mean the five solas. You know, I don't think I heard that yeah. until I went to college. Well, no, that's not true. I heard that in high school because I went to a classical high school. We used a reformed curriculum called Omnibus. And so one of the books that I had to read was Chosen by God by R.C. Sproul, which, uh, which introduced me to the concept of predestination. And it is a great book. R.C. Sproul is great. I think yeah. I think uh, double. I think I think Sproul's a Lutheran. Eh, well, you know, I, it's interesting. I since I have become Lutheran, I've noticed that he's he seems to be the Reformed theologian that Lutherans respect, unlike say someone like Paul Washer or um, uh, uh, John MacArthur. More like more like Paul washing away assurance. Am I right? <laughs> I tweeted that the other day. I so. yep. Yeah, I should have I should have RT'd that. Yeah yeah. I I, I watched Paul Washer <laughs> in high school. My brother really mm -hmm. got into him, you know. It was like, tell me how bad I am, you know. There's there's a certain uh, <laughs> yeah. There's a certain element of uh, what's the word, 
say sadistic uh you know and 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 that's Mm -hmm. that's the law you know and there's a place for that we need to we need to be told that but then but as you know obviously if we're if we're here saying these reformed people they confuse the law and the gospel that's absolutely true and people stop listening because they're like yep i've heard that before but it doesn't stop being true yeah i uh uh, I, I had my first few months as a Lutheran, I, I became a Lutheran in 2018 and my first few months as a Lutheran, it was me every day texting pastor Joe every day about what a terrible person I was. <laughs> and he would just always text me back and be like, look at the cross, look at the cross, Amen. look at the cross every time, every time, you know, and it's, I like, I had to detox from from like the law approach of reformed theology Absolutely. because it was reformed theology was my gateway to lutheranism it was my way out of i grew up charismatic pentecostal holiness um hyper charismatic nar and stuff like that and reformed theology the intellectual rigor of it was my gateway out of that theology and into lutheranism but uh the five or six months I spent like being reformed. I mean, like it, it was like, it did like damage, like not, not in like, I don't know. Cause there are a lot of great reform people. Um, and there's a lot of good theology there. Like Sproul. I was all about Sproul. Mm-hmm. Um, but like it, it definitely turns you in on yourself. Absolutely. Um, yep. So, uh, so tell me, tell me more Dutch reformed to Lutheranism. Tell me more. Yeah. Well, the missing, the missing link there is, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't really Dutch reformed theologically. I guess I was just generically reformed. And then I went to college. I went to new St. Andrews college in Moscow, Idaho. And, uh, so, so, uh, so that's, those who aren't familiar, it's a small liberal arts college founded by Douglas Wilson, who is a pioneer in the classical Christian education movement, and who also started the CREC, the Community of Reformed Evangelical Churches, which is a small uh, reformed denomination, sort of kind of in the Presbyterian tradition, but with strong uh, Baptist influences. And I want to say that a lot of people hate Doug Wilson. I'm not one of those people. Uh, I have, uh, I, I, I have, uh, I have um, various opinions on on his theology and, and his work in Moscow. But I only benefited uh, from my time at New St Andrews. That college is great. I recommend it to everybody. Um, well, I was going to ask if we're talking about the same Doug Wilson that everybody hates on Twitter. Well, you know, the thing is, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean. People, people, I lived there for eight years. I don't want to talk about, I mean, I actually, I'm happy to talk about, to talk about it, but um, a lot of the stuff on Twitter is just made up. I mean, just completely made up. Yeah. I mean, people think he eats babies basically. And, and that's because it's, it's based on, you know, there's a lot of broken relationships, people who really are, are very bitter against him and also people who are Christians. And then there's people in the town who are uh, hippie, hippie dippy. And they just they hate him. They think he's a they think he's a Nazi, and so uh, he, yeah, just and 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 I I I I don't uh, I don't agree with his rhetorical approach on a lot of things, um, which is putting it mildly, in fact. But as I say, I I profited from being a member of I was never a member of his church, so um, the only time I've ever interacted with him personally was when I took a C.S. Lewis class from him because he's a big fan of C.S. Lewis. And that was really, really profitable. But so I was a member of a church called Trinity Reformed Church. It was uh, Peter Lightheart's church, if, if anybody's familiar with Peter Lightheart. Uh, and then he, he moved on from Moscow. But that's a more a little bit more high church. So I didn't realize this at the time, but it's weird for a Reformed church to use the Anglican liturgy, which is what they were doing yeah. and what they still do. God bless them. And uh, so that was, that was awesome. I mean, I was like, this is so cool. 
Uh, this is so different from where I grew up. Um, the, the robust singing of hymns, love that. The liturgy, love that. We confess our sins corporately. We kneel and we take the Lord's Supper every week. So I, I just love that. And, and I, 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 I owe them so much. And that is, uh, that is where I, I, I met my wife, uh, I protract. Oh, wow. She wasn't, she wasn't my wife then when I met her. Uh, <laughs> right. um, I met her in 2013, I think. And then 2014 started to have a crush on her. Um, and she was Lutheran. Um, uh, her dad, oh. her dad is a Lutheran pastor. And in fact, he was a pastor in uh, North Carolina in uh, the Charlotte area for four years. Oh, okay. That's uh, right up the road for me, about three hours. Yeah, and um, and that and that's so. My wife has a little bit of an accent. She grew up in Southern Maryland, and then Missouri, and then North Carolina. And so I met her. So she was she was at the school. There were a couple Lutheran kids at the school. I was I I was and still am friends with all of them, and uh, a different outcome. So one of them kind of became reformed, one of them uh, is now a Lutheran deaconess, and then uh, one of them, my wife, kind of did the reform thing for a while, and then and so she and I were reformed, and we were reasonably happy with that, um, and and I, I I guess what really the the, the thing that I the thing that became a point of contention was Eucharistic theology, not between Brianna and I, my wife's name is Brianna, but um, I, I just, I wanted to learn so, I wanted to learn more about the sacrament. So I, 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 I read what every Reformed confession has to say on the subject, what Zwingli has to say, what John Knox had to say in the Scots Confession, I had read Calvin in college, but reading again uh, the the Consensus Tigerinus and um, and the Westminster Confession. My favorite Reformed uh, expression of the sacrament is definitely the Belgic Confession. Going back to the Reform, uh, going back to the Dutch Reformed tradition, the Belgic is great on uh, it. Definitely as good as it gets from uh, from a Reformed perspective. In my opinion, uh, also Heidelberg. Heidelberg is is good too, but Belgic is better. Um, and so, so I was just like trying to find in the reform confessional documents, what I felt was the case, which is that I would, I would always go back to the word efficacious. The sacrament is efficacious and, and reform theology is like, yeah, the sacrament is efficacious. It, it's, um, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a memorial. It's, it's, it builds us up. It's a meal that we're sharing together and heck, you know, we're, 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 it's a spiritual event where we're transported up to the yeah. throne room of God, which is where Christ is uh, seated at the right hand of the Father. And, and we go up there and we go, we go up there and we, we join him there. Obviously, uh, there's no <laughs> funny, funny thing. When I was considering Lutheranism, I was like, so this is, this is how I understand Calvin's view. Um, and, and that's, I, I think that's a decent understanding of Calvin's view, but mm -hmm. but most Reformed people are Zwinglian. They really are. So the so mm -hmm. so Calvin had this idea of spiritual real presence. That's how it's termed. So not real presence as Lutherans understand it, as maybe some Anglicans understand it, but real presence in a spiritual sense. Now, the word spiritual and the word real, I think, are actually not compatible in that statement. But um, so, so that's one problem. But really, also, the, the main problem is that when you just get right down to it, most Reformed people don't even go there. They're, they're essentially Zwinglians. And I mean, that's, they're not alone. I mean, you've probably seen the data saying that 30 or 40 percent of Roman Catholics, if you ask them, What's your belief about the sacrament? And you give them a couple options. They'll pick the one that sounds like Zwingli. So yeah. ultimately, it's Zwingli's world, and we all are just living in it. No, I'm just kidding. No, thankfully. Well, no, but really, <laughs> honestly, um, I think Zwingli is probably um, one of one of the one of the worst things to happen to Christianity, um, just over his sacramental theology because it is so widespread. 
There's a couple of things I want to talk about real quick to, I want to derail you just a minute. Yeah. Um, uh, first off, you're right. The reform do say that the sacrament is efficacious. Um, but for what? Efficacious for what? Like they just say it as an adjective, right? Like, oh yeah, of course it's absolutely efficacious. For what? Because I, I would say it's efficacious for the forgiveness of your sins. Right. That when you take the sacrament, you are truly forgiven. Um, but they wouldn't say that. So right. what's it efficacious for? Yeah, I, 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 I never truly discovered that. I would hope that they would affirm that it is for the forgiveness of sins, since the Bible literally says that, uh, Matthew 26, 28. Reform people, leave a comment and <laughs> let me know. Yeah, I just, I, I, I really, I don't know. I felt like, I felt like I was driving a car, and I really liked the car. I'm really into cars. I was driving a car. I really liked the car, and and people were telling me what a cool car it was, and then I, I just I started realizing things about the car, like the AC didn't work, and oh, third gear doesn't work. It just grinds. Oh, the tires aren't very good. Ooh, the brakes aren't very good. Ah, oh, man, the engine is making quite a funny noise. But everybody's telling me what a great car this is. Reformed Eucharistic theology, and and such a great. And I'm just I'm just limping limping along here. And so, um, so yeah, so so at, at Trinity, which has such a robust, uh, it has a, a Trinity Reformed Church, Moscow, Idaho. Excuse me, it has such a robust Eucharistic. Um, liturgy, it's like you're at an Anglican church. I mean, it really is. And, and so it, when, when you guys, I'm sorry, um, prior to the Eucharistic liturgy, when you do corporate confession, was there also corporate absolution? Uh, yes. Yeah, there is. Okay. Yeah. And uh, to my, I, I really, I'm not, I don't have the, the, uh, the book of common prayer memorized, but you know, I think so much of it comes out of there. And I, I'm also not an expert in, in Anglican liturgy, so I really don't know um, how similar it is to, to Lutheran liturgy. But all right. my wife and I started considering, well, first of all, we were like, okay, we're going to move to Minnesota. So what kind of church are we going to go to when we, when we go there? And you know, there's, the options for us were Reformed or um, uh, Anglican. And so we checked out an Anglican church, and that was kind of, they were very nice, but uh, they were you know I'll I'll just tell you what my main problem was. My main problem was that they had women communion servers, and I just don't like that. Okay. I'm not on board with that, and um and also contemporary worship music, very well done, but um contemporary, and I didn't like that. So then we went to a Reformed church in the tradition that we were from the CREC, uh, and the main problem was that it was 45 minutes away, but we stuck it out. We were members there for a couple of years, lovely people, still friends with them. But, you know, we still, we had a kid, the, the 45, 50 minute drive became less and less workable. And, um, and we, we didn't want to move farther west toward the church because then we'd be further from my family. Uh, so it just, who lived directly east. So it was just a, a tough place to be in. And my wife and I really struggled with this and it was a tough, it was a tough thing. We were like, man, we love, we love this church. We love the fellowship. Uh, there's things we don't love, but overall we don't want to be negative Nancy's about this. We have a church that's good that, you know, we, we have things that most people really wish, just wish they had in church. However, yeah. ultimately, we felt we had to make a move. So when we did uh, in the fall of 2020, well, yeah. So the first thing we did was we visited another Anglican church. It's an Anglo-Catholic church. And there are about five people there. And it was the highest church um, thing that I've ever witnessed. Uh, the pastor, the priest did not face the congregation the entire time other than delivering the homily and uh you know the bells right the bells to in yeah. and when you think about the bells some lutherans do the bells i'm not a fan of the bells the bells are uh you know they're supposed to indicate that the miracle has taken place 
the bread and wine have been transformed. And Lutherans do believe in uh, not a transformation, but that the, the, that the body and the blood of Christ are bodily present in, with, and under the elements. Not that the bread and wine are gone, vanished, kapoof, and that only their accidents remain you know, in the Roman Catholic formulation. Right. And pretty much Anglo-Catholics believe in transubstantiation. So other than right. the church being very small and also relatively far away, we just, it was a little bit, eh, eh. So, um, so that was, <laughs> I, I know, yeah. So that was October 2020. The, the, what was happening at that point was, coincidentally enough, my brother-in-law uh, and his wife, who uh, had their baby, and they live in New York. And so we went out there for the baptism. And my brother-in-law is a Lutheran pastor. And he and I had locked horns a little bit. He knows much more about theology than I do. And, um, however, I never, I never got the sense that he was uh, walking circles around me until we had this one conversation in October or so of 2020. And we were talking about Calvin's Eucharistic theology. And we were talking specifically about that idea that um, that Christ is in the throne room of God. He can't be elsewhere. His physical body can't be present in the elements. Oh. And uh, and 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 Jordan, my brother-in-law, Reverend Jordan Vogus, he was kind of like, I don't know, man. It seems kind of complicated. I know him. Oh, really? Yeah, he's. I don't like know him, know him, but like I, I think I'm friends with him on Facebook. Yeah, he's he's an awesome guy. He uh, he serves the the people of uh, Good Shepherd Lutheran in uh, Warwick, New York, um, and uh, and they are blessed to have him. Um, this is my wife's sister's husband, and yeah, so he's he's just like I don't know. It just seems complicated. Like I was like, darn, it does. And like when you put it that way. When you put it that way, I, I think people think that Lutheran Eucharistic theology is more complicated, is more yeah. weird, it's more um, fuzzy, more uh, diaphanous than Reformed Eucharistic theology. Reformed Eucharistic theology is supposed to be um, simple and clear logical. and logical, right? Yeah. And I just, at that moment, and, and since that point, I just had the feeling that Occam's razor cuts uh, cuts uh, Reformed Eucharistic theology because it is more complex to say that Christ is, that we are somehow yanked up to the throne room of God because somehow Christ is mm-hmm. stuck there, the resurrected Christ, the Lord of all creation, who, you know, just to take the sovereignty of God thing, which Reformed people rightly emphasize. God is sovereign, but somehow Christ, who is God, is stuck. He's stuck. He can't move. He can't come down and be where his people are, except in a spiritual sense. And even that, when he promises, when when we get to Calvin, Calvin says that we are uh, yanked up to the throne room of God, like, like like the canister at a bank, you know? You put it in, it goes... Yeah. And that's that's what happens so, to us, supposedly. <laughs> I'm glad we I'm glad we circled back to this because I actually wanted to bring this up earlier too. This is the other thing about Reformed Eucharistic theology that doesn't make sense to me, other than it's efficacious, but like we use that as an adjective that doesn't mean anything. The other thing that I wanted to bring up is that you're telling me you're telling me that it's impossible for the Almighty God to be present. In bread and wine. That's impossible. Cannot happen. But me, a mortal man, finite in all my ways, dust of the earth that I am, am more able than Christ because I can go up to heaven during the Eucharist. Christ can't come down. That's impossible. But me, dust that I am, sinful wretch that I am, I, more powerful than Christ apparently, (laughs) can go up to heaven during the Eucharist. That makes no sense to me. Right. That has never made sense to me. Yeah, I, I that was that was kind of the the revelation that I had. It's just like Lutheran Lutheran sacraments theology is simpler, and not that the simplest explanation is always truest, 
But with the simplest explanation that fits the facts, that fits the promises of Scripture, tends to be that, that in my opinion, that's, that should be a theological guide for us, you know, to an extent. So Lutheran, so in that sense, Lutheran Eucharistic theology is, uh, it, it's arguably simpler than Reformed Eucharistic theology. Certainly, I would argue that it fits the words of Christ uh, much better than Reformed Eucharistic theology. And it's also simpler than Roman Catholic Eucharistic theology while fitting the words of Christ arguably better or uh, certainly um, no, no, no less so than Roman Catholic theology does. And, and, and I think yeah. the greatest tragedy of that is that so few people even know <laughs> that reformed, uh, theology, uh, is a thing. Like the only thing I knew about it growing up was consubstantiation. That's the only thing I heard, which mm. turned out to be wrong anyway. And that was all I knew. <laughs> and I, I also knew something about Wisconsin Synod Lutherans, um, not wanting to pray with me, you know, that was growing yep. up in Wisconsin. Yep. I didn't even encounter that, but I just heard about it. And uh, so, you know, we, we can talk about whether that's a good witness later, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Spoiler. It's not <laughs> right. So I knew nothing. I knew nothing. I, I saw nothing. It was like Schultz on, um, uh, Hogan's heroes. And, you know, the, the, the funny thing to me is that, it took, it took having a Lutheran father-in-law, having a Lutheran brother-in-law, having a, a Lutheran-ish wife who really she became reformed and then took the journey with me back into Lutheranism. And, yeah. uh, and that's the only way that I was exposed to it. Although, actually, that's not quite true because the other way I was exposed to it was through church history. And I, I, went, I went to a reformed school more or less pre-K through 12 and then four years of college. But then I did a graduate program in history. And but before I even did that, I started reading more about history. Specifically, I read Dermot McCullough's book about the Reformation. And I realized I realized what that I was missing. I was missing Martin Luther, you know, Martin Luther in the reformed um, the reformed telling of the history of the Reformation. He kind of fades away. Um, he, yeah. he fades away. He, he's the John the Baptist. And then depending on yep. whether you're Zwingli or Calvinist, he prepares the way for either Zwingli or Calvin. And, mm -hmm. and that's just, that's just not. Yep. He, he, he nailed the 95 theses to the Wittenberg chapel door and did nothing else. Right. Like, you know, oh, no, the, no, you're the forgetting. Copious, he also oh, wrote the bond of the stand. will. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, he wrote select portions of that that we like to quote. He didn't write the whole thing. Yeah. I don't know who wrote the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, but the select quotable portions that the Calvinists love, those are the ones, that's the bits he wrote. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. it's interesting because he he wrote so much. He wrote so much. Um, I, I've got over, I'm looking at it right now over on my bookshelf. I've got Luther's works. I think volume 73 is the only one I have. Um, but it's, it, it's hardback and it's the, it's the size of my, I don't know, probably a Bible. Like it's a huge tome. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not a large font size in there. It's a, you know, decent font size. It's a lot of words that he wrote. And, like, that's number 73. There were 72 before that, and I think there's, like, another 40 or 50 after that. Wow. You know, not to mention his commentaries and the, the work he did in the catechisms and, and our own confessional documents. Like, the guy wrote. The guy wrote. And, and personal letters, I have a book that's his personal. He did so much. Yeah. And you're right, the Reformed, they just uh, ignore like all of that. Yeah, John the Baptist. I've never heard it put that way, but that's exactly it. He he was sent to prepare the way for Calvin or or Zwingli or or, or whomever you think you know the Christ to be, I guess. Right. Or or maybe wow. maybe you're Moravian and you you like uh oh, what's that guy? Can't believe I'm forgetting his name. Oh yeah, Zinzendorf. Yeah, yeah, maybe mm -hmm. maybe you like the radical reformation and and Martin Luther is the yeah. the John the Baptist for them. So yeah, we can all agree though he didn't go far enough. <laughs> right, exact, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So 
Yeah, I, I, I read I read Dermot McCullough's book about the Reformation. He is an he's an Anglican or was. Uh, I mean, I don't know if he's 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 a I think he's I think he's a Church of England. Uh, the Lord should the Lord blesses all transgender people. Um, you know that type of guy, and um, and yet it's just so clear that Luther is the center of the Reformation. He's not the John the Baptist of the Reformation. He is the Reformation, and everything that comes yeah. after that is yeah absolutely important. Reform theology is important. Can't ignore that it exists, but um, and and the Radical Reformation obviously is more and more important as we see uh, the the rise of the Charismatic movement in global Christianity. You know, that's that that comes that comes out. I mean, well, you could argue that the charismatic movement is really only 120 years old in a sense. Like it does. It's but the roots well, are the roots are certainly in the radical reformation. Nobody would argue with that. Well, they had they they had um, they they had these specific charismatic types at the reformation that are, that based on my own reading of the history of that are pretty indistinguishable from. The charismatics we have today, people claiming to receive Latter Day prophecies, right, like uh, of the Spirit, babbling and calling it speaking in tongues. What's his name in uh, at, at Munster, where they had the? I don't know. Yeah, shoot, you know that was the, the, pe- the peasants' I'm not, I'm not war, gonna... <laughs> or like look one of the one of the early problems in the Reformation is, is yeah. the enthusiasts, and so so yeah, yeah, absolutely, Luther Luther has to deal with those people. Um, uh, I think it says so much about American culture that enthusiast is an absolutely unalloyed good thing for us. And so when we hear someone yeah. being called a religious enthusiast, it's just like, okay, well, you mean they really like Jesus? No, no, it means they're crazy. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I, I also think I also think it's that it's so um, Americans have a difficult time with Christianity because uh, Christianity is almost antithetical. Uh, to a lot of American cultural ideals. Um, you know, um, America, we're fiercely independent people, uh, fiercely so. It's almost like every, like the Europeans do not understand us at all. And it's, it's almost like all the, all the independent uh, Europeans left and came here, you know. Um, uh, other cultures around the world are very collectivist, and we are not right. at all. Um, we praise the independence and the people that blaze the trails and all this. And Christianity is very much not about blazing trails. And it's very much not about... So So in charismatic theology, you're always given big kudos for discovering something new mm. in Scripture, something that no one else has ever seen before or heard preached on in a certain way, you know... Um, I remember Jensen Franklin, uh, Chris Roseborough got on Jensen Franklin for preaching a sermon on the traveler, and and it was it was the 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 prophet story to King David about the man had the the ewe lamb that he raised as a pet oh, yeah. in his home and he loved, and the traveler came and said, "Give me." Give me a feast, and so the the rich man went and stole the ewe lamb and all this, and so Jensen Franklin preached about the traveler, even though that's really got nothing to do with anything. Um, it's just sort of a a prop for the story, right? But uh, that's all charismatic theology is 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 praising the guy blazing the trail, uh, preaching on something new, and and actual historic Christianity is the exact opposite of that. It's about not at all discovering anything new. It's about accurately taking uh, what you have been given and passing it on. Right. Uh, just pass on the teaching of the apostles. That's all you need to do. There's nothing new. There's nothing to add. There's nothing to, to, to probe deeper about. You just take what you've been given and pass it on. And, it, and I don't know. That's just, that's, it seems very antithetical to um, American ideas and culture. And I think that's probably why that sort of enthusiastic charismatic theology catches on here because right. it's very much like that. It's that fiercely independent. Well, the Bible's good and the fathers are good and the preacher is a good man, but the Holy spirit is speaking this to me personally. Right. You know, this is my experience. And yeah. Yeah, I, no, absolutely. And I think, yeah, absolutely. You see that. 
and and now and now that's taking off in global Christianity, like um, yeah. the you know the the fastest growing uh, religious uh, groups in the global South are charismatic in South America and, yeah. and Africa, and 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 there's an element of it that's prosperity gospel. You have um, econ- mm-hmm. countries that are rising economically, but where there's also this great gulf between the rich and the poor or they're not rising economically. And so then you have people's expectations just not matching up with reality, which of course is true here. Right. We have the prosperity gospel here in the richest country on earth. So of course they definitely have that in Ghana and in uh, right. you know Uruguay. But yeah, so it, it's... Uh, it's it, it's almost more dangerous in those places because that, that kind of theology also gives rise to a lot of syncretism and a lot of like worshiping the old gods with the new kind of a thing, you know, um, they, they really just sort of, they use charismatic theology to Christianize their animism. And that's right. like, that's not good. <laughs> no, that isn't good. Or certainly, uh, also to worship money, you know, and, mm. and I think Americans are, yeah. we, we don't realize how much we do worship money just in the same sense yeah. that like, like Americans can't really define gluttony. Like, what is that? <laughs> what does it actually mean? To, to eat too much in it in a world where in at least in the nation where we have so much food that when you eat too much you're not literally taking it out of someone else's mouth right it's it's not a zero sum game in this country we have so much food right. that we throw you know some large percentage of it away and so what what does gluttony mean in that sense same with greed yeah. you know you're not literally stealing from the poor you might be stealing from the poor through legal economic means like payday loans or something and maybe maybe right. are, are being a slumlord, you know, but that's totally legal. And people are just thinking, I'm just getting what's mine. And they don't understand yeah. that that's, you know, actually, that's a problem. I think yeah. I think yeah. that's why Lutheranism. I, I listened to a podcast recently where uh, with uh, a Lyman Stone talking to uh, Aaron Wren, uh, who's a, a really interesting guy. He, the, he does a couple, a couple things. Um, why? Uh, I'm forgetting the name of them. I think the American Reformer is one of them. And, uh, and oh, the Masculinist, I think he does. Um, yeah, he's a really, really cool guy. So Lyman Stone was talking about the, the origins of Lutheranism in America and why Lutheranism didn't become super successful. You know what? I'm actually mixing up where I got this. That's a, that was an interesting episode, but I'm getting this from a podcast of these three Hillsdale history professors do called uh, okay. Paleo Protestant, and it's a Lutheran, an Anglican, and a Presbyterian. Oh. And uh, the Lutheran guy's name is Corey Moss. I, I haven't uh, interacted with him. Uh, and then um, Miles Smith is the Anglican, and uh, Oh, what's his name? Uh, Daryl Hart is the is the Presbyterian. Anyway, so they were talking as historians. Why did Lutheranism not? It's obviously a huge thing. It's, I mean, it's one of the biggest conservative Christian denominations. Yes, true, but it's it's still it's it's very geographically limited, uh, and and in terms of our growth, our growth just our growth just isn't happening. I mean, you could say that about every Christian denomination right at this point. The Southern Baptists are, the, the, if the Southern Baptists are declining with their huge emphasis on revivalism and conversionism, then, uh, then you know, and also just demographically, uh, our population is aging and we're not having babies, which are, right. as, especially the fact that we're not having babies, is pretty much, you know, doom if we don't change things up. But Lutheranism came to America, and yeah, it changed. It became more congregational. Uh, you know, uh, attempted to, and, and there's been a push me pull you uh, aspect to how congregational is it, um, it, it, in my understanding, which is limited. But um, but it ultimately it never became mainstream, and it, it could never not in the way that Methodism or Baptist could be, because they were the uh, they were the native soil almost, uh, especially yeah those two particularly. Presbyterian, Presbyterianism also, but never, never the numbers. I mean, if you look at the Presbyterians, it's it's like a like a fifth or something of the size of the Lutheran 
the conservative Lutheran churches. It's nuts. Mm. Not the PCUSA. The PCUSA is big. Right. But it's still smaller than the uh, than the LCA. And it, it just it's it's just funny. It's funny to think about that. However, I you know, I ended up in the same place I grew up, which is the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And when you're here, Lutheranism becomes a real option. And so it's actually interesting to see. So to finish my story, we started attending University Lutheran Chapel in Minneapolis, which is an LCMS congregation. And the first day we went, I was just like, I, I told my wife, this is such a breath of fresh air. The, the liturgy is here. The sacrament is here. The word is here. And, um, and it's just, this is wonderful. And so, and we've been going ever since. And it was, it was, you know, yeah, it's, it's, uh, with COVID and, you know, there's all this, you know, things, things were more difficult, but, but we, we went through catechesis, joined the church and it's just been great. One, one question. What, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, what's, what was the hardest thing for you going from reform to Lutheran? What was what was the thing you, you struggled with? I think that the Reformed are really good at getting people to read their Bible, and they're really good mm-hmm. at Bible studies. And um, now, problem for that with that is that the church had all these great Bible studies and stuff that were going on, but it was forty five minutes to an hour, depending on traffic, to get there. Right and. So that was just a problem. Um, now, granted, actually, I remember there was a, a, a Bible study that was in the East Metro, which we did go to. But that then became more difficult because it's just difficult to grab your kid and go somewhere once you have kids. So, but, but yeah, I would say, I would say Bible studies are something that the Reformed people do really well. And that's a good thing. I am not knocking that at all. Mm-hmm. Now, when you say well, you need to go to a Bible study or you're not saved. If you, if you talk about Bible study as being some type of, um, uh, which I think is kind of how the Mormons... Barometric test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. if that's the, um, if, you're, if you're fruit checking and uh, if that's where you find your assurance and you say, well, I went to Bible study last week and, and didn't hate it too much, you know, that's wrong. That's not where the Bible yeah. tells us to find our assurance. But the Reformed people are good at that. Um, and that's something that so, but it's not like Lutherans are close to that. It's not like Lutherans are antithetical to that. My wife started a, a women's, uh, well, actually, no, it's not a women's Bible study. It's a women's book group, but an opportunity for women to have fellowship with each other. And that was great. Yeah. And, I, and I've been talking with a pastor about doing some type of men's, men's thing. Cause we have the, 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 uh, the church is really focused on students, which is wonderful wonderful to have all these young people but they are all a little bit atomized you know they're focused on the classwork they're focused on their jobs and they don't have families so uh so it's just it's kind of it's kind of getting just getting people to 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 do that type of thing um but it's been great so yeah the the hardest thing you know that's interesting when when we had uh so when we decided that we were going to change our membership to the lutheran church we had to meet with the elders at our Reformed church, which was um, a completely uh, cordial uh, occasion. All right. Um, and I'm still uh, associated with pretty much all of those people through work or through other uh, other avenues. And but one one question that has stuck with me, uh, one of the elders who did grow up LCMS, and he he said. So, so we spent most of the conversation talking about the sacrament and, and none of them were able to, to tell me that I was wrong. You know, none of them were able to say, right. no, Luther had it wrong. Maybe they were just being too polite, but you know, I, we were, we were arguing about it. We were going back and forth, you know, cordially. And I just, I didn't hear anything that was, that was, that, that was convincing to me. Right. The the one thing that they did say that there was one elder said that has stuck with me said, okay, all right. If you're getting the sacrament, if you're getting what you believe is a biblical understanding of the sacrament that we don't have here, well, what are you losing? What are you leaving behind? And and at the time, I thought, wow, this is a good question. I mean, like, 
first of all, we're leaving behind friendships. I mean, we're not breaking it. We're not burning any bridges with these people, but we're just not going to see them as often. That's, it's always tough. Right. It's tough to leave a church that you really like. And, um, and then, yeah, like there's aspects of reform theology that I'm just not going to be as, as connected with reform. People are, are really generally just really dynamic. They're always doing something. You know, they, they have this mm-hmm. motto, Semper Reformanda, you know, they're always talking about that. They're always reforming. They're always starting up little new denominations or new colleges, new publishing houses, whatever they think is, you know, whatever they think needs to be done. And and there's an element of that that's good. But there's also an element of it where they're always looking for something new. There, There's, you know, the next book on biblical theology is just going to be better. It's all, it's all automatically going to be better. The next book on the sacraments is going to be better. Oh, you didn't like Leonard J. Van Der Zee's Christ, Baptism, and the Lord's Supper? Uh, classic Dutch reform take on the sacraments. Well, the next book on the next book will be better. There'll be another. You find another. There's a. Uh, there's so many books. Reform theology is about books, and mm-hmm. there's always another book. Read this other book. You'll you'll um, you know. I I find I find in Lutheranism. The it's it's often the other way, it's often the other way. It's like, oh man, you didn't like Brian Wolfmuller's book? Go read, you know, uh, CFW Walther. Oh, you didn't like him? Go just keep go back another two hundred yeah. years and read that guy. Interesting, you know? interesting. I know. I think that's true. Like, you know, the the um the Westminster Confession of Faith is like this. You know, if you yeah. don't include the the all the explanations and stuff. But this is the Book of Concord, you know, it's and this is not this is the small edition, right? Like the, uh, the yeah. Concordia edition is bigger. This is the LCA edition. Who knows what they took out? No, I'm just kidding. This is this is complete. <laughs> Half of it. Yeah. Um, in fact, just at every they actually didn't take anything out. Um, the ELCA edition, it's the exact same, but they put an asterisk at the end of every sentence. And then at the very at the very back of the book, the key just says, uh, you know, if you want. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> it's actually interesting. I got this copy used, and it was a pastor studying at an ELCA seminary in Iowa, or a seminarian. Huh. And I had this in, in the 80s, and I have to say, he underlined all the right things. And I just love that when yeah. I buy a used book, and the stuff in it that's underlined and, and circled is, like, really useful to me. Uh, because it, and it helped me get through this book, to be completely honest. It's quite long. So, so, so yeah, Lutherans, and, and I think there's a broader movement in the church, not among everyone, because I think there's two directions. The center cannot hold, Remy. So people who grew up in this Baptist, non-denominational background, if they get an itch and if they decide this isn't, this isn't cutting it for whatever reason, then there's several directions they could go. So they could go full Pentecostal. They could go full Charismatic. I don't, I don't know what the term that they prefer is. And I've seen, I've seen people that I know do that. Not well. Mm-hmm. Actually, that's not true. I don't, I don't really know anybody who's like full speaking tongues type of thing. I know people who go to that type of church, but it's more like it's not because of the tongues thing and the weirdness. It's because they want something dynamic and new and friendly with lots of activities mm-hmm. for kids. The other side, yeah. the other thing that people might do, it, it, basically it's the megachurch thing. Why do people go to megachurch? Because they are they have a bunch of locations, it's convenient for the kid, and they have you know a million things for the kids to do. Because megachurches know if you hook the kids, the parents will come, right? Um, yeah. At least that's their, that's their strategy. I don't know if that works. Then there's people, maybe you know, I certainly knew, I certainly know. It seems like every, every type of high church Protestant I know is flirting with going uh, Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. <laughs> and I know plenty of people yeah. who have made this. Yeah. I, I know Eastern Orthodox converts. I know Catholic converts. And, uh, and probably the biggest single piece on that Venn diagram is people who grew up, and for me, just in my circle, people who grew up. Uh, reformed or not nominational Baptist, they were uh, they were certainly Reformed slash Presbyterian college, and now they're Anglican, because Anglicanism is this thing that can become all things to all people, and it, it really it yep, really thank you. <laughs> yep. I love I love I love my Anglican friends and family members, but that's what it is. Yep. You have the third. I go ahead. I, I, the go no go ahead. You have the uh, so like you have the thirty nine articles. It's. Uh-huh. Talk about short. It's very short. 
And there, to, mm -hmm. to my knowledge, there is no other binding catechetical document that they have. And not even that. I this is a I've told this story on this podcast three or four times. Now I'm going to tell it again. <laughs> it's literally my favorite interaction that I've ever had with an Anglican. It was on Twitter, and I always say the people become Anglican because you don't have to believe anything to be an Anglican. You can believe whatever you want and still be an Anglican. And and a guy said, "Well, that's not true." He said, "I'm an Anglican, and that's not true." I said, "Do you have?" Uh, is there any kind of absolute binding confessional document you have? He said, well, absolutely. We have the 39 articles. And I said, great. Do you believe the 39 articles? He said, well, me personally, no, I don't subscribe. <laughs> but you're still an Anglican. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. No. And yeah, like all, and the thing about, they talk about the zeal of a convert, right? So a lot of the Anglicans I know, heck, almost all of them, are Anglican converts. And so, you know what? They love Jesus. They're not, they're not mm -hmm. weirdos. You know, they, they love Jesus. They wanted to find a place where they could have the historic faith of the church. And, uh, and, and, and they like doctrine too. You know, they like N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright's an Anglican theologian. And yeah, he is. Absolutely. But N.T. Wright is wrong about Paul. So there's that. But, <laughs> but also, uh, N.T. Wright is, is not, you know, binding on anybody's faith. I'm so glad that you have right. N.T. Wright. I think I have, oh, it's downstairs. I have, I have N.T. Wright books. I like him. I read one book of his. I'm going to forget. I think it was called Jesus and the Victory of God. That blew my mind. Okay? He's great. But you can't, you can't have a theological tradition that's upheld by one guy, you know? And I'm not, or or yeah. even a bunch of guys. Maybe like, Robert Capon, maybe you've, I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a, another 20th century Anglican divine or heck C.S. Lewis become Anglican like right. C.S. Lewis. That's great. But I, I love C.S. Lewis, but the thing is it just, there's not enough meat on that bone. You know, if, if yeah. for, for me and, and just like, and, and Anglicans would would deny this up and down because they, they, they create their own meat. You know, they, 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 they take some veggie burger and they they put <laughs> they they put it on. Not, I'm just I'm I'm teasing. I'm I'm just. You heard it here first, folks. Anglicans are the veggie burger of Christianity. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so I I find I find Christians making one of two progressions. They're either going more charismatic or they're going more liturgical. Now, why? My question is, why don't more people see? A liturgical LCMS church or AFLC or AALC or whatever as an option for them. Now there are a couple reasons why. Uh, certainly, first of all, it's that these people tend to be in coastal cities and they tend to have advanced degrees, whereas Lutheran churches tend to be in midwestern small towns and the people don't tend to have advanced degrees. I mean, I live in Lutheran heartland. And I go to one of, as far as I'm aware, three or four confessional Lutheran churches in this entire city of four million people. Um, wow, yeah. It's just nuts. And, and uh, well, actually, I don't know what, about the Wells and, and the other small churches, but there's only four confessional LCMS churches here. Now, some of them are very large, but, um, and, and the, the ones that aren't quote unquote confessional, you're still going to get the word in sacrament. You're just also going to get probably relatively bad contemporary worship music. Which, if you're someone who's wanting to convert to something different than your Bapticostal background, and you want something new and different, then that's not going to appeal to you. There's an aesthetic, there's right. an aesthetic element to it, and I, I'm not saying that that's bad. That was certainly an element of it for me as well. So, but I want, I want Lutheranism to be. First of all, I think Luther was right, <laughs> and, and, and Melanchthon was right, and Chemnitz was right. And because of that, the Lutheran confessions are, are correct, and they're, uh, they're, 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 uh, they're true uh, because they reflect the truth of Scripture. And, right. and, and since I believe that, I want people to become Lutheran. So because I want people to become Lutheran, I want Lutheranism to be more attractive to them. And... And and for most people, I think, I think that Lutheran, Lutheranism 
The main problem is that it's uncool. And I'm not suggesting that Lutheranism should go chasing after pop culture, uh, not pop culture, chasing after cultural relevancy. If it did that, we would be talking about uh, transgender uh, uh, pastors within 10 years, you know? Like that is, right. you cannot chase cultural relevance. However, I, I still want to, uh, in my, my personal networks, I want to show people who are Reformed or Anglican or whatever, I want to say, you know, Lutheranism, if, if, they, if they express to me, I'm just not loving where I am, I, w- I want to be a cheerleader for Lutheranism. And it's interesting because I've actually seen a couple results to that. Now, um, my, my parents were going to Dutch Reformed Church, as I mentioned, and now they're going to a Lutheran Church. And, uh, and I, I, I didn't have, it was independent for me. I didn't really have discussions with them about it. And, you know, who knows if that's where they're going to stick long term, but I think that's cool to see. I have, um, I have other, I have another, another guy I know who is Anglican. Now he's attending an act two two guys I know who are Anglican slash reformed and are now attending uh, and LCMS, LCMS churches in various parts of the country. And then one guy and his entire family joined an LCMS church, and he's become a total zeal for Lutheranism bro uh, here in Minnesota. And I just love seeing that. And it just, well, yeah. You mentioned you mentioned that, you know, like a lot of us, because these people are like East Coast types, and Lutheranism is very much an American heartland kind of a thing, and even then it's sparse. Um and then earlier, way, way back in the beginning, you were talking about um, the Dutch Reformed Church, and that was just sort of the church you grew up in. Um, and and as, so that's a lot of it is, especially when you're talking about low country folk, uh, people that are just humble, blue collar, your farmer, your electrician, whatever. And I just love Jesus, and I wanna, I wanna have uh, the right kind of faith, and that really is just loving people and trying to live a decent life, you know, and, and that the nitpicking around doctrine isn't really something that I'm concerned about. All those kinds of people, which is the vast majority of all humanity um, for all history, right? The, the, the vast majority of people. They, that Dutch Reformed Church, I'm going to use it as an example. The people that attend that Dutch Reformed Church are Dutch Reformed because it's a Dutch Reformed church that happens to be close to them. Yeah. Right? Like if it were a Baptist church or an Episcopalian church, that's what they would be because that's the church that's within a reasonable distance for them. And, you know, like I know people that go to the, go to this little Baptist church um, up the road from where I work and they go to that church because it's the only church within a 20 minute drive. Mm-hmm. Are they are they Baptist? Now I know the the pastor there. He's a good guy. Um, he's a pretty pretty reformed. He, he's a very kind and loving man. Uh, but he's very like, intellectually very reformed, very Calvinistic, and all. Are his people in his congregation? I know a lot of them because I work with them. No, no, they're not. Um, but like that 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 doesn't. The two things don't have to match, right? His his beliefs in theology, the church body's beliefs in theology. It's a Southern Baptist church. He's a Reformed Baptist, Reformed Baptist guy preaching at a Southern Baptist church with a bunch of people who are only there because it's the closest church in 20 minutes. You know what I mean? And it's, I don't know. I wonder if we we had this conversation come up at our church. Um, uh, This guy is really all about the church and, and like helping out, man, let's fix this up. He, comes in after work, comes in on Saturdays and, you know, helps cut the grass and do all this stuff, you know, paint the building and he wants to, you know, spruce it up and and do the thing. And that's great. I love it. That's wonderful. But we were talking about how do we handle new people? How do we handle new people? And he talked about the big mega church, how they have like this whole greeter program and all this. And I said, you know, I've been, I've been kicking around that idea for a while and I would love to have your new, you come in and someone says, Hey, have you ever been to a Lutheran service before, what I'm going to do is take you to a host family in the pew. Hey, come on. These are 
These are the Carswells, and they're great people. And sit with them, and they'll help you through the liturgy and show you what to do. And if you have any that. questions during the service, ask them, and they'll, <laughs> you know. And we get church members to volunteer to be host families for new people that come in and all this. And uh, and my buddy at the church, he was like, yeah, that's great. But I was thinking more like we could have coffee in the foyer and maybe like add a guitar instead of the organ. And I was like, no, no, we're going the wrong way. Going the wrong way right. here. That's uh yeah, I think that's interesting. You have to, like, the people I was talking about, the intellectual converts, that's always going to be a small uh, a small number of yeah. people. Now, like, if you're a denomination like the OCA, the Orthodox Church in America, the converts are swamping you, you know? Like, that was a mm-hmm. small denomination to start with. And I've been to several Orthodox services where I know that, no, 75 people percent of the people there are converts. I have close friends and family members who are Orthodox. So God bless them. But um, it, it remains to be seen to me whether that type of thing is generationally uh, lasting or whether, yeah. you know, like, oh, does that type of thing die out in the first generation? So the, the intellectual converts, it's always a small number. They're not going to they're not enough to sustain a denomination that's large like the LCMS that is dealing with a demographic crisis. We don't have enough pastors. We, uh, the, our demographics, people love the LCMS, people who are our LCMS love it. They're grateful for that. It's a faithful witness. I mean, I just, yeah, everybody I talk to who's a Lutheran is just so grateful to be Lutheran. I love that. But, um, but the demographics are these churches are in rural areas. Rural areas are declining in population. So, yeah. You know, it, it just and and also it, with the rise of the nuns, right? You know, uh, 30, 40 percent of Americans now don't identify with a religious tradition, which has tripled since 2000 or something. You know, yeah. the, the numbers are the, you can look up the numbers, but the amount of people who are just no longer interested in attending church on Sunday is nuts. But so what you're so, talking about is the church needs to be for the lowest common denominator, too. And I think it, it, it can't yeah. it can't be smells and bells all the time if that's going to make people feel weird about it. And yet right. on the other side of I, it, you can't make it, it be a mega church, a weird, you know, just screens right. and fancy carpet and chairs and a, it's like a Justin Bieber concert. And I think the small catechism is really helpful there because Lutheranism is not this it, it does not have to be this complex, heady intellectual thing, which both Reformed theology and Eastern Orthodox theology are in their separate ways, right? Yeah. Lutheranism does not have to be that. You don't have to be a, a genius or a uh, or a some kind of PhD to come to the table and understand what's going on. Right. So you and you have and as you say, that is the mo- majority of people who want to come to church. They're not head cases like me. You know, Lutherans do not have to read the Book of Concord to be Lutheran. You should, but you really right. just have to yeah. read the small catechism, subscribe to that, talk to your pastor, go through catechesis, and bam, you're Lutheran. Uh, it's not hard. There, there's a there's a Hindu guru in India. Uh, that I ran across about 10 years back and just seems like a really honestly kind of wise and loving sort of dude, which I imagine, you know, once you're 70 years old and a Hindu guru, that you kind of get that way, I guess. (laughs) Um, But he, uh, he had this idea that all of nature was interconnected. And so they had these dry rivers uh, running through his province in India that that all these rivers had dried up. And so he said, well, um, you need trees. You need trees. Because if you ever notice, a healthy living river has a lot of trees and plant life growing along the banks because, you know, the water feeds them. And and everybody told him, they said, well, Guru, you can't have trees because there's no water. And he said, no, you don't understand. It's all cyclical and interconnected. And if you plant the trees, they will draw the water. And everybody was like, no, that's not 
how science works. That's not at all a thing that happens. But he went in his province, he started in his town, and just started planting trees along the riverbank. And sure enough, within about a year, year and a half, the, this river came back to life. And there's water flowing through this river again. Wow. Uh, yeah, because he was planting trees. And, uh, you know, trees that were supposed to be there, that would be there if there was a river. And uh, everybody's shocked by this. But I, I, I think there's something to that. Um, and I think that we can solve a lot of our demographic problem um, uh, in Lutheranism by planting trees along the Dead River, right? We're saying, oh, we don't have enough people. Our churches are shrinking. What do we do? Should we change our worship program? Should we update the liturgy? Should we do this? Should we do that? No, I think we should plant more churches. I think we should plant more churches. I think if we went into these rural areas where we don't have a presence or where our presence is dying off and we planted more churches, I think we would have a bigger, a bigger presence. I think people would come if, you know, we were around for them to come to. You know, I, I think we need to start planting trees along the Dead River here and just start putting, putting up churches, man. Yeah. And I know it's like tough. Um, the LCMS doesn't have enough pastors. The AALC doesn't have enough pastors, but... I mean, really, I think if we just started planting more churches, um, you know, so, so many churches, they, they, get to this, they get to this size and this number, and this is where they're, they, they're excited to grow. And, oh, man, look at all the stuff we can do when we went from 200 members to 500 members, you know, to, to 800 members. Look at all this stuff we can do with this big church. But we've talked about this at our own church council. If we hit 200 members consistently, like, that's good. That's Probably too much. Maybe 140 is about what the fire marshal says we can fit 140 people in our sanctuary. So that's probably about it. And and when we when we start hitting 200, 250 members, um, the you don't build another building on the plot of land we have that can accommodate the congregation. No, you plant a church. That's what you do. The, this this church is full now, according to the fire marshal. So we're going to take 50 or 60 of you. Uh, that are located in relatively the same area on the other part of town, and we're going to build, you know, another church over there. Saint whoever, Saint who cares, go build a church over there. Um, you know, call it like Fountain of like Glory. That's what you do. Some classic LCMS seventies name, Fountain of Glory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's one. There's one near us called Easter Lutheran Church, which I just. Oh. Yeah. I actually think it's the LCA, but kind of a base name though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, me and my buddy, we have this, we have this game where whenever we travel or go to a big city, um, we always take pictures of and text the ridiculous Catholic church names that we can find. You know, like the Basilica of Our Lady Mary, Queen of the Universe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like, great. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't remember what somebody was talking about on Twitter. They said some, some social problem that we have and. And Catholics are like, oh, no, no, it's okay. It's okay now because Pope Francis has consecrated that problem to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. What? <laughs> what does Great, that perfect. mean, first of all? And second of all, I don't know how that's supposed to help. But anyway. Um... <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll, uh, I have some Catholic friends. I'll ask them and see like, what that's supposed to do because, uh, you know, I'm sure I'm – sure... Uh, that, so this is where the Catholic and the Reformed actually have a lot in common. Catholic theology, while oftentimes when it comes to their Mariology and other things, it's not very biblical. It is very logically consistent. Oh, yeah. Um, very, like you see, I had a, a Catholic priest explain to me the Immaculate Conception of Mary, uh, start to finish. And it makes a lot of sense. And none of it is like not biblical. Like none of it contradicts the scripture. None of it's in there, but it all does sort of make sense. You know, we start with Mary as the new tabernacle, and we kind of move from there, and we make these logical conclusions. And, you know, it all makes sense, I guess. I, I you know, I don't know. I would almost, the way he explained it to me, I would, I'm going to get in trouble. Here we go. I'm a bad Lutheran. I would almost chalk it up to Adi Afra. Like, if you want to believe that, you can, I guess, because it's, I don't see anything in there that's, like, explicitly anti-scriptural, other than maybe, you know, all of sin. Um, I would say probably applies to Mary as well. But anyway. Interesting. Uh, Moses, thank you for being on, man. It's my pleasure. I, I, I really appreciate what you're doing, um, interviewing interviewing uh, people who, I don't know. I mean, what am I? I just, I'm just a convert, you know. I'm a, I'm a Lutheran. 
I have no, I have no, uh, I have no ax to grind. I'm not angry at anybody. You know, I just, I just love being a Lutheran. Oh, give it time. Right. No, no. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't love the people. I, I don't hate the people that I left. You know, I, I don't have, right. I don't have any bitterness against them. I'm just grateful to be, to, to have found a place where the Lord's Supper has the meaning and baptism. The Lord's Supper and baptism have the meaning that Christ gave them from the plain meaning yeah. and clear words of scripture. I'm just happy to be here, man. Is there anything we can plug for you? Anything you want to promote while you're here? Well, uh, I don't know when this is going to be released, but um, I'm going to be giving a talk on May 7th, I think, um, in here in Minneapolis. I don't know if it'll be recorded, but if anybody's local, I, 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 will, I will post a summary on my blog, which is mosesproucher.wordpress.com, and I'm going to be giving a talk about my, uh, my dissertation. And uh, my dissertation is about religious doubt in the Victorian era and, uh, wow. and how, how, how the Victorians tried to combat it and, how, whether we, and what lessons we can learn from them. And uh, so I'll be giving a talk about that uh, at, at the Davenant Institute, um, Twin Cities uh, Convivium Irenicum, May 6th and 7th. Uh, and there are tickets available. So if anybody's local, check that out. I would love to love to meet any of your listeners who are in the Twin Cities. Uh, it's a it's a kind of a the Davenant Institute is this ecumenical thing. It's mostly Reformed, but there's a bunch of people, a bunch of Lutherans and Anglicans involved now, which is great to see. It's kind of like yeah. the Reformed version of uh, Justin Sinner or um, what is his uh, press called? Uh, it, it, that is what it's called. Yes. Yeah, and Brad Littlejohn is kind of like a, a reformed uh, Jordan Cooper, <laughs> although his beard is not as epic, definitely. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I check that out if you're in the area. Um, and if you're in Minnesota, check out the work of Minnesota Family Council, mfc.org. Love to get to get to, love to talk with anybody who's who's listening. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs>